This is option three, sports medicine. How is injury rehabilitation managed? The objective of injury rehabilitation is for the athlete to return to play as quickly as possible after the injury. However, this is often not a straightforward process as there are a range of factors that determine when the athlete is ready to play. One of these factors is the rehabilitation procedures, how well they are implemented. And those procedures are the four dash points for this particular syllabus point. Now they're highlighted in red there, they are progressive mobilization, they are graduated exercise, which is a three step process, there is training and there is the use of heat and cold. The right hand side of the syllabus says that you have to be able to examine or justify rehabilitation procedures used for a range of specific injuries. For example, it says hamstring tear and shoulder dislocation. Um, I think hamstring tear or any uh, sort of muscle tear is a good scenario to go with. Um, most people are familiar with them and it's a good idea as I talk my way through these dash points that you could actually apply that to a specific injury scenario. So the first dash point, progressive mobilization. When RICER is finished, then progressive mobilization starts. Now progressive mobilization is getting the injured area moving again as quickly as possible um, without pain so that the athlete can return to play as soon as possible. Now progressive mobilization can be achieved in two ways in terms of getting the injured area moving again. It can be done what is called through active exercises which are performed by the athlete or it can be done by what's called passive methods where the joint or in the injured area is manipulated by another person, usually a physio, and this is considered the best option. Progressive mobilization should begin soon after the injury because any inactivity at the joint and the injured area can lead to increased scar tissue. Now scar tissue is not beneficial as it's not as functional as the tissue that replaces it. So progressive mobilization helps reduce them the amount of scar tissue that occurs at the injured site. The next dash point is graduated exercise and that's a three step process which I'll talk about in a minute um, that includes stretching, conditioning and total body fitness. As the name suggests, it's starting exercise again gradually or slowly after the actual injury. And it's a three step process and the first of this is stretching. Now stre stretching helps the rehab process by it actually strengthens the muscle and it helps return the injured area to having a full range of motion again. Now the recommended form of stretching is called PNF stretching and that is stretching where you are assisted in the actual stretching process. The next part of the three step process is conditioning. It is important that the injured area is strengthened as soon as possible. Rehab exercises commencing with low demand or using light weights around the injury and then they then progress towards using more demanding type of exercise usually with heavy weights. The third and final step is called total body fitness. Once the conditioning of the injured area is almost complete, rehab then involves returning the full body to its total fitness or called total body fitness. After many weeks on the sideline, the athlete can lose their fitness pretty quickly. And in some instances, total body fitness can be improved while the injured area is still being treated. One popular method is the use of swimming while physios or rehab staff are treating injured legs. The next dash point is training. Particularly after long periods on the sidelines, such as for an ACL injury where the athlete can be out for up to 12 months, the athlete may not be ready to return to play even after returning to full fitness. That's when they have to do special form of training. That's because some of the components of fitness, such as timing and coordination, may not return to the athlete as quick as, for example, what cardiovascular fitness has, and therefore special training is needed. In many instances, this includes simulated games. Now, in some examples at a professional level, this may also mean the athlete returning in reserve grade type situation before they make their reappearance in first grade. The athlete needs to be pain free before returning to full training. Fitness tests may prove if the athlete ultimately has rehab successfully. So that might mean the, re, uh, the athlete doing some sort of strength test to see that they still have the same strength as what they did before the, the, before the injury occurred. The last dash point is the use of heat and cold. The choice of heat and cold treatments is dependent on the stage of the rehabilitation. Now heat treatment does increase blood flow, which is a good thing. 
Sometimes more blood flow means more nutrients and oxygen are transported to the damaged tissue, but not in the first 72 hours. If it's used in the first 72 hours or what's called the inflammatory phase, the first three days, heat treatment may increase inflammation and this can actually prolong injury recovery. Heat treatment does help to decrease pain and stiffness. Finally, cold should be applied in the first 48 hours after the injury and it's actually part of the actual RISA treatment, which is an acronym for rest, ice, compression, elevation and referral. Ice treatments help to reduce blood flow to the affected region. It's beneficial in the inflammatory response stage of the injury, which is the first 72 hours. It helps reduce the amount of inflammation and swelling. The recommendations is to ice for 20 minutes every two hours for the first 48 hours and it decreases pain. So that's that dot, dot point covered. If you have more information on any other topic in PDHPE, you can find it at the website.